everyone. Aloha. Thank you for taking some time off your afternoon to be here. Um, so let me preface this a little bit. Um, so what I'm going to present, um, and it's going to be very informal, so as we go along, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to interrupt and um, I prefer to take it that way as we kind of go through. Um, what I'm going to talk about is actually uh, not something new. It's, it's um, some work I did over 30 years ago um, when I actually started out in the field. And it was, it was how I actually got, got started. Um, it's work that we did um, on seabird feeding um, back during um, the late 70s and, and early 80s. Um, and there was a cooperative agreement uh, between um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the state of Hawaii, which includes the University of Hawaii and NOAA. And, and what it was at the time is a tripartite study to look at the resources of the uh, Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. You know, and I'll show you what that is in just a little bit. Um, but this study was a cooperative piece of work and I was, I was just getting out of school at the time. And, um, and so I joined, joined it and it, little did I know at the time it would evolve to be such a, a seminal work that, that stayed with me uh, for my career. Um, while the data may seem data, dated, it's, it's not, you know, it's, um, it's something that in today's day and age where we, um, uh, we manage by ecosystems and understanding of how the ecosystems work um, holistically, it's, um, it's, it's come back to, um, to inform us um, in many ways of how to, how to manage our, our resources. Um, the, uh, since, the top, since we completed it back in the 80s, um, there really hasn't been much done um, that, um, that has changed the way we thought about how, how the birds eat, what the birds eat, and how they interact with, their, with each other and with the other um, animals that they share the environment with. So, so it's still very valuable. The names have been changed. Um, surprising that I didn't realize that, but it's, uh, um, it's still a, a good way to, to understand how, how, the birds, how the birds act. So um, how I've organized the talk is to, um, is to um, kind of talk about the diet study in general. Um, and how I'm going to introduce it is to construct it in the sense of feeding gills. I'm sorry. Can you speak a little louder, please? Sure, I'll try. <laughs> and if I fade during the talk, raise your hand because I, I tend to do that. <laughs> and if I fail, you might have to come sit up front. <laughs> um, uh, so where was I? So these are um, how I how I've arranged it are based primarily on these three papers that, that came out during the time. Uh, the first was the, the monograph that captured the, the actual diet study of the 18 species of seabirds that we looked at. Um, we followed that with um, a paper that we published in Bolton Marine Science, um, looking at a more detailed um, analysis of trends of just a couple of a couple species, and I explained that. Um, what that gave us in a little bit. And finally, in a chapter in the Croxel book, we looked at um, the trophic relationships and how they interacted with the fisheries. And we kind of, uh, we defied the guilds. So um, that's how we, at least I've kind of approached um, how I present this today. And then I'll, I'll, I'll kind of close off with um, kind of where we're looking at some of this work today and how we intend to kind of move forward and the questions that it, it poses as we go forward. Oh no. Hey Lani, did I hit the wrong thing? Oh no. Oh, we're good. So the the this well we the study was done in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands and um, not knowing how much you all know what that is, you know there's a, a series of leeward islands that extend beyond Nihau um, going to the northwest for some 1,200 miles. Um, over this, in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, there are some 55 million seabirds, 22 species that nest and breed, and they call it, um, call it their home. Um, throughout the area, they're ecologically linked with tunas, and seabirds consume an estimated 42% of the annual production of small pelagic fishes and squid. At least in the French frigate shows is somewhere we could where we did a model, we did an ecosystem model and came up with that estimate. So 
So we looked at 18 species of seabirds and I'll kind of walk you through those in a little bit. Um, we did field collections. Um, we collected some over 4,000 uh, samples and we did this two ways. It was a cooperative with the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, they had field cams that would be staged on the islands themselves and they collected bird, bird regurgitations. That's what these are, these are bird regurgitations. And then um, the fishery service would take cruises. So we had a research ship pictured here. This is the North Ship Townsend Cromwell that's since been decommissioned. But she would go up there and we had many a trip where our task is part of the cooperative work were to look at the fishery resources um, for the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands back in the day. Um, to do that, we, we would go off and there were one dedicated cruise, but by and large, otherwise um, we would put folks ashore because they were also looking at turtles or looking at mud seals. And so we also had gone out and collected seabird samples as well. As I said, these are all regurgitations um, and we would bring them all back to the lab. They were preserved in 10% um, formalin in the field. Um, they were all brought back. Um, they were identified, the prey were all identified, enumerated, and um, an estimate of biomass through volumetric measures. Um, and then that gave rise to the frequency that we use in our analysis. Um, I think what made our study unique amongst many that have gone on around the world is that we actually used fishery people to do the identifications um, rather than those who, who weren't familiar with the fauna. And we thought that went a long way to lend uh, credibility to the, to the study itself. What you're looking at here in the bottom picture are three fish and how we primarily um, did the identifications. Um, well, obviously, a lot of the prey items are digested. Um, you don't have a whole fish. But we're able to identify many of the fish through their vertebrae. Um, the easiest way to do that is to clear and stain. We didn't clear per se the way they'll do it in a museum. We just peel away the flesh and stain the bones to look at the, the fine features of the vertebral structure that allowed us to identify them. Always to species, but often to, spe uh, often to families, but often to species. So we're going to talk about feeding guilds. And, um, and, we, and uh, we're kind of organi I, we organized this um, into five guilds. And this is based on similarities in the type of food that they ate, the size of the prey, and the strategies of how they actually went out and fed. Um, they don't fit exactly right, but for, it's, a, it's a good convenient way to kind of organize um, how we think of them, and especially for how we're going to present it today. So the first one are the albatrosses, and these are two of them, um, the black-footed albatross and the lace and albatross. Numbers in parentheses are the number of samples that we took from each of them. Um, for this part of the study, they were taken throughout the island shade, so the samples represent a spattering um, throughout from Nihua all the way up to uh, Kiri Atoll. Um, I'm going over this pretty briefly. I'm not going into the real details, um, but the highlights of what they're what we found in their diets by and large albatross are scavengers um, that's why they have dynamic soaring it's one of the capabilities for flight they're able to cover vast amounts of ocean just scanning what's at the surface um, they do use surface seizing maybe they'll stop at the surface and pull up pull something they see there um, but often they're just scavenging they'll follow they'll, they'll follow boats they'll follow um, follow where you have convergence areas to just collect food as they went along. Hence, when you looked at what we found, lots and lots of beaks. And the beaks, squid beaks, um, and what, what that showed us, one, one thing about albatross, why I said they're able to retain a lot of the undigestible items in their stomachs. So when, you, when they regurgitate, um, what you're getting, unlike the other birds, are not um, are often not just the recent pieces that they've made, they can, it can represent a fair amount of time that they collected what they've eaten because the indigestible items would, would just collect in the stomach until they release them as castings. So if you ever, if you walk the, the colonies themselves, you often find um, castings and what they were were little torpedo shaped tubes of indigestible items. I don't have a picture one, but often what you find are a collection of these chitinous squid beaks lenses of their eyes and plastic 
and um, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, um, plastics and digestible. So often in the castings, you get those three things. Um, the picture on the bottom to the bottom le left there is a, a recent picture that I put off the internet of a dead bird with the plastic that they found, um, obviously, in, in, in their gut. Um, when we did the study 30 years ago, the amount of plastic was was of an order of magnitude less. Uh, we did measure, we did count, um, but what you find today is um, it's incredibly disturbing. And, um, and, and, and we will say that, it's, that's, that I think is a real eye opener to, to how things have changed. Um, Blackfoots more so than Laysan because they are real scavengers. They're the ones you see behind the fishing boats um, are the ones that really, um, you see plastic really dominate what, what's, what's, what they're taking in the ocean. You see the mass next to the beaks up there in the picture, those are flying fish eggs. Um, and that, that became a, that's a really big, that's the number one food item we found in the black footed albatross. What's interesting about that is the, the eggs float because they are attached to some mass. They're attached to either pumice, uh, uh, foam, or a plastic piece that, that's buoyant. So they're at the surface and they're, they, they serve as a substrate for the flying fish to lay their eggs naturally. And then the, the birds seem to take it in, and that's one way the plastic actually gets into their system. The lace and albatross were a little different. And while they ate, um, they both eat a lot of squid, um, the lace and albatross didn't eat as much as much flying fish eggs. They ate um, this thing on the right. They're called um, Valella Valella. They're, um, uh, I forget what their common name is. They're um, By the Wind Sailors, I think it is. The picture on the lower right, it, it's hard to see, but but that's that's all Valella on the ocean surface. So I've been out um, in the North Pacific when this would go on for miles, tens, twenties, thirty, forty miles, as far as you could see. These things would occupy the surface of the ocean. Not surprisingly, when you have a lace and albatross coming and you have a stomach of Valella, it's normally a hundred percent of what they eat are are these. I don't know what the nutritional value is. Um, they're much in a way that um, a lot of fish eat salps, and we always wonder how much they actually get out of there. It's actually more than you think, so my guess is that they're also, in a similar matter, getting some nutritional value out of, out of these things. Pelicaniforms. Now, these are um, the boobies, the frigates, the tropic birds. Um, up there, they, we have five of them that we studied. Um, they, they are... Um, I, there are no white-tailed tropic birds up there, so these are the ones that occur. Um, the mass boobies, uh, the red-footed boobies, who, are, who nest in the, the low shrubbery, uh, the brown boobies that are on the, um, they're normally on the ground um, at all of the islands. Uh, the frigate bird, they tend to nest on um, small shrubs as well, and the red-tailed tropic birds who are, who are ground nesters. They all consume uh, flying fish. Um, the actual flying fish, and they tend to be of the larger size. Uh, one thing about seabirds that we do the study, we talk about what they eat. Um, you always have to remember that they, the, all of the, how they partition the resources, they eat various parts of, of the resource. So the smaller birds actually always eat the smaller juvenile forms of squid and fish, and the, and the larger birds such as these are eating the subadults and adults of the same fish. And while they are eating the same thing, they're eating, they're eating different life stages of the resource. The pictures I showed, I, I picked to kind of show you what they, they feed on. Um, these are the three major things. The top one are, um, are flying squid. They're omastrephids. They are the most dominant pelagic squid in the, in the oceans, the road oceans. Um, here around Hawaii, there's, um, there are two species. Uh, one's called uh, Stenotuthis. Japanese call it tobika. Here in the here on the main islands, um, they just called. I'm not even sure what they're called, but they have a. They used to fuel the Ikashibi fishery off of the Big Island. Uh, they're here all year long. All the all the birds, all the seabirds in the main islands feed on them as well. But as you can see, this is Omastrephes. This is the larger, the commercial fish that's uh, the commercial squid that's fished in the just north in the temperate North Pacific. 
um, they actually do fly. So they have the nickname flying squid, and recently they've actually shown that show them to fly. Are you so flying fish or squid? No, so I'll, I'll touch on that in just a second. So the top picture are flying squid. So it's flying squid. So they actually fly. So you can see them. So that's a picture of. I'm sorry. The middle picture are the squid flying. So that's a school of flying squid. If you went up closer, the one on the top is a flying fish. Okay. So those are exocetids. There, are, there are about 20 species of those that occur in the world's oceans. They're surface dwellers. They're commonly eaten by any of the fish that feed at the surface, such as mahi mahi such as marlins, but also the seabirds, because they all compete for the, the resource at the surface. But I make the point of showing these two, because they leave the water, a lot of the birds are able to catch their prey because they leave the water. So these birds, by and large, tend to, are able to dive. They're able to, to plunge. You know, you know, tropic birds, they'll sight from a fairly high level, and they'll, they'll just come straight down and plunge into the surface waters. The boobies, they don't, they, they, they'll plunge, but not quite from those depths. The frigate birds can't get off the water, so they tend to pirate or they'll pluck. But all of them are very maneuverable, and so they can, they can, they can um, take the prey when they actually leave the water surface, which these often do whenever they're spooked. The third piece down here is um, what you often see as, um, in, the, in the publications, you see them called decapturists. They're called macro scad. More commonly here in Hawaii, it's called opelu. Uh, there are four species of opelu that until we actually started doing these feeding studies, we by and large thought there was one species here. Um, still is dominated by one, the one that, that they fish off of the big island, but there are actually another three species that, that are relatively common, especially in Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. Um, all of the seabirds, pretty much, you'll see it pop up there. They eat they eat them from when they're very young to the adult size. Um, it's the same one that you go to Tom and Sherry Market and, and buy to, to eat yourself. But it's a big part. It's a big part of the, the forage base that feeds not only the seabirds, but a lot of the commercial fisheries. Okay. Um, turns and shear waters. So these have the, the most species. Um, and then these include, um, I'm going to start with the sooty terns and the wedge-tailed shearwaters because they are, together numerically, the most abundant seabirds in the Hawaiian Islands. Um, if you look, the sooty terns make up 48% of the birds by number. Um, the wedge-tails will add a number, what is that? I can't even see that, 17% or so. But together, they are by far the most numerous. If you go to Rabbit Island, most of Rabbit Island is, you know, it's a bird sanctuary. Um, the wedge tails have their burrows up the slope, down in the down within the crater. Um, the sooties are everywhere on the top that that the wedge tails burrows are are not. Um, and the noddies, the brown noddies, are the only other one that kind of occupy the rim. Um, the other birds we include here um, are the white terns. You see them down in Waikiki, but. Um, but they're, they're throughout the islands in the, in the trees. They're um, uh, black noddies. Um, uh, they're a smaller version of the browns, uh, the Christmas shearwaters. Um, not as common, but nevertheless throughout the area. Um, so these birds together, um, and we say these are the ones that you often hear them um, refer to uh, as being driven by the, to the surface by, um, by fish schools. So when this was, when the study was done, and you go back there, the largest fishery in the state of Hawaii was the, the Poland lime fishery for skipjack tuna, otherwise known as aku. There used to be a cannery down there at Kewala Basin, Bumblebee Seafoods, used to can coral tuna there. So the, the small sand pans were the largest fishery. They would go out, they would catch their bait, and then they would go out and, and look for, for schools of, of skipjack. The, the main cue for them to see the fish were the birds. So back then, that, that, is, that is how they would actually go out and find the fish, where they're dependent on the birds. And the birds depend on the fish. It was, a, it was a vice versa, right? So they would go and, you know, the fish would drive the, drive the, the, 
drive the prey to the surface. In this, in this case, there'll be schools of juvenile squid, the same squid that we described in the last slide. Um, mulids, mulids are young goldfish. Goldfish are veke, they're, um, they're kumu, they're moana, if you think of your reef fish, all of the barbed, uh, the barbed goldfish that are on the reef, they all have pelagic stages. And until they get to a little bit about three inches or so, they're pelagic. They're, they're balls of schooling pelagic forms that are out there and they're brought up to the surface and, and made exposed to the birds by the tuna beneath them. The same for the decapters. These are the opelu. They're juveniles. They get to about the same size, three, four inches. They're schooled. They come up and they're and that's the, the fish to make them available for the birds. The black noddies, the white terns, they tend to be a little more on the inshore. They tend to feed more in association with the jacks. You find this um, in their diets because what they're eating, they're also eating juvenile forms of fish, but they're lizard fish. So a lot of them, all fish on the reef have pelagic forms. So whether they're the lizard fishes, the cynodontids, whether they're the dart fishes, they all school and have fairly large numbers of young post larvae, I'll call them, that school and are made available to these birds. They tend to sit there and pick um, as small birds on the inshore waters, and that's, that's what makes up the bulk of their diet. And of course, flying fish, we talked about those. Pictured here is our approximate sizes, um, 30 to 50 percent squid in all of the, in all of the birds, that's, that's their diet. These are small amistrephids, um, same as was a fly, it's, uh, these are juveniles. These are, these are pictured here are just adult small forms of one of the species within the family. Um, the picture on the bottom is a, a hole, then one stayed picture of um, a, a young apello. Uh, the one in the middle to the left are uh, young goldfish. Nocturnal petrels. So there's three of those. Um, there are boars petrels, bonin petrels, and sooty storm petrels. These were a challenge. We have very few. You can look at the numbers. There's only 100 boars. There were 10 sooty storm petrels and 144 bonin petrels. Um, in some cases, they were very difficult to sample. They, they're on the rocky cliffs. Um, they're not there. They forage very far. They're solitary in general. They're nocturnal feeders and they don't return very often with full stomachs. Um, you, you, you squeeze, you, what you often get are just oils. Um, what you see in the results of our diet studies are, are based on maybe just a cleatrum, or one of the bones or a hatchet fish that is identified as one of their primary items. You have beaks, you'll have lenses from squid, but that's really all you have. And, and part of that is, is because they're, they just, it's been so much time at sea that we just don't, we were never able to get the get them back in top, get them when they return with enough food in them to really get a good handle. Um, um, since then, you know, it, we um, other other folks have tried going out to sea to actually sample them at sea, um, haven't had much luck. Um, like again, because they are solitary feeders, they're not like, uh, many of the birds who aggregate at convergence areas, um, they're just very, very difficult to sample. What we do know is they also eat squid, um, and they tend to eat bioluminescent animals, meaning fish with light organs. Um, often they're mctophids, we know that. But we would find hatchet fishes, and that always puzzled us because unlike mctophids, not unlike lantern fish that do vertically migrate, hatchet fishes do not. So somehow they are able to feed on fish that don't naturally vertic vertically migrate to the surface. So how they pick those up has always been a mystery for us. Um, Mucid feeding terns, and these are um, the, obviously the less abundant of all of the seabirds up there. These are the grayback terns and the blue gray noddies. They are much more prevalent in the Rocky Islands, uh, Nihoa and Necker. Um, and they're, they're not nowhere near alike, but they're together because they don't fit under any of the other gilts. Um, 
and the two things I picture here are actually not because they're cool. They are pretty interesting, but those are the most, um, they were the number one ranked food item in their respective diets. Um, for the blue gray naughty, they're pickers. They pick their new stem pickers. These are insects. So they're water striders. They're little black insects at the surface of the water. Um, they're found in almost every sample that we encountered. The other were cowfish. Um, they're juvenile cowfish, or the big. Um, they were the most common item in, in gray back turn stomachs. Um, but they're not big players, uh, but they're, they're two of the birds that make up the population up there. So what have we learned? Well, we learned what, um, you know, pretty much Ash, there, there were folks on Ashmore and Ashmore, they were the pioneers who did the original seabird feeding studies down at Christmas Island back in the 60s. And um, we found here what, what other people find other, elsewhere in the world. They're, um, the tropical seabirds do exhibit feeding behavior and strategies that by and large restrict feeding to the surface waters. Um, they, um, the areas generally lack seasonal abundances for food. Um, as opposed to say the temperate areas where they become, they're very, very abundant, they're rich and support large, large populations of birds. Um, and they're apex, they're apex opportunistic predators, meaning they live at the top of the chief food chain or very near to it. And they'll feed on anything of appropriate size in surface waters around rooting or roosting areas. They do not travel far. And so they'll go out there and if whatever is in the environment that they can get at, they'll feed on, which you'll see makes them very good candidates for trying to look at what, what's happening in the ecosystem in these areas. So the next step was to look at, well, we kind of know that, we kind of know what they eat in general. We wanted to do something a little more. So we wanted to look at what are the trends and the variability. So what we did is we went to French frigate shows. It's about halfway up the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. Um, to that tall of a, of a, a bunch of little spits, if we will, the sand spits. Some of them come and go. I think some of them have been gone for years. Um, but we picked two species there, um, the red-footed booby and the black knotty. And, and we chose those because they're there all year round. A lot of the birds are, they, you know, they come in, they nest, and they're there for a part of the year. They, they kind of go up back to the ocean. <clears throat> but these two birds nest there all year round. So we were able to collect collect them all year. So our goal was to go out there, collect five samples from each species every week for as long as we could. And that's what we did. So what you see in these pictures um, are um, on the upper right are the are four major prey of the black knotty. Down here on the lower left are four major prey of the red-footed booby. Um, there are three trends for the black knotty because we were able to take the prior study, we did the monograph, we took, that study was done from 78 to 83, we took the average, we looked at their the diets for what they what they ate at French frigate shows and used that also with the trend analysis with what we did for um, 1982 and uh, 1981 and 1982 um, in the current study. Unfortunately for the red-footed booby, that was not possible. We didn't have enough samples from French frigate shows per se. So we only have the information collected in, in this series. But what we found was amazing, and it was a really a surprise to see the coherence in what they ate um, throughout the year and from year to year. So you're looking, what you're looking at the graphs and, um, and the upper left, let's take the ones for the black knotty, you're looking um, at cynodontids. Those are lizard fishes. Mulidae's are uh, the goatfish on the upper right. Um, I think they're omastrephis. These are the squids on the lower left. And microdesmids, which are dark fish, on the lower right. And you can see the patterns. What they are, they're, they're put out by seasons. And you can see the trends and the availability of the forage there for them to exploit. And if they're there, they feed on them and they reflect. And these are frequency of occurrence of those prey in their diets. So if you look at over time, over the course of the year, it's, it's very regular that you have an influx of these, of this forage base for them to exploit. What's circled there is a, it's a difference, what the, diver, the, 
convergent pattern that we saw in 82 and 83. What we believe that reflected was the 82-83 uh, El Nino that came through and changed the composition of prey within that area that they were feeding. Um, the composition of prey within that area that they were feeding. In this case, um, for the, well, they are able to adapt. So in the case of the black knotty, um, we saw a reduction in squid availability, and they were able to replace that with the availability of goldfish. Similarly, for the red-footed boobies, they also, they saw, um, they saw, I can't even see that now. They saw um, an availability of squid, which took the place of the, um, the, lack, the absence of, of flying fish um, during, during that period. It's unfortunate that the study did end at the end of 82, um, that we weren't able to follow it through into 84 with the passing of the El Nino. Uh, we have it entertain thoughts um, with the Fish and Wildlife Service of resuming the work to kind of look at them as um, ecosystem indicators and monitors of, of what the system is doing. Because we do feel that they do reflect very well on what's going on out there. So where are we? So we did that. Um, and then, like I said, it, it's, um, it's old technology, but it's, it's still very, um, very vital. And not a whole lot has been done since then. But there have been new approaches. Lots of folks who deal in the world of feeding studies have looked at other ways to get at um, looking at what how the various marine animals feed. Um, they use stable isotope ratios. This gives you trophic levels um, you know, in a broad sense. Um, these fatty acid signatures, um, this was good. The, the shortcoming of this is that it requires you to have a library. You have to have a set of knowns. So, you need to collect all of your prey to have a, a fatty acid signature. So when you go back and you actually get the sample you want to analyze, you have something to line it back up to. Um, these approaches integrate the dietal information over space and time. But if you can do that and you combine them, combine these bio biochemical methods with um, some conventional sampling, uh, we can really uh, make some, at least we think, and uh, get some pretty uh, make some great strides in interpretation of, of diet. So where do we go from here? Um, for us, um, we're not active in the seabird feeding world anymore, although we're always willing to partner and, and participate. Um, we have, a, like I said, when we open, there are a lot of pieces that we need for, for management. As we go into the world of ecosystem, management, not only for fisheries, but for coastal resilience or for all of the aspects we go to to be good stewards of the environment, um, we need more information. And seabirds are obvious, very obviously very important pieces of the ecosystem, um, the marine ecosystem for, for all of these tropical areas. We need time series. And often that's really the, the hardest thing to get because they're expensive to maintain. Um, but you need that. You need to know how things are changing. You need, you need to know how things were, how things are, and how things are moving forward. Um, these are key to have as your indicators for ecosystem health. Um, in the case of seabirds, I think um, uh, feeding, feeding habits is one good way to get at it because I think they are predictable. And I'll show you another one as I close out here. Um, you need them for indicators of environmental state, of marine debris. I mentioned of how just just seeing it's it's, um, it's anecdotal, um, but you can see the amount of plastics in the ocean have grown just so substantially over the 30 years that I've been involved in the business, and it's not getting any better. Um, and we continue a lot continues to go in um, the anthropogenic inputs into the oceans, not only at sea but terrestrially um, are being seen everywhere in the ocean. Um, climate. Climate's a, a big concern. We are being charged um, to consider the climate effects in the, in the sustainability and management of all of our resources. It's a tough deal. It's a tough deal. You don't know where we are and what the impacts are. So we need more than anything, we need to know how these, how these um, resources have are and are being um, over time. Uh, we want to use the information for managing the protected areas. More and more you hear about the establishment of sanctuaries, monuments, 
refuges, um, all of these things are coming to bear. Um, and it's good. So they need to know, are they being effective? So we, we use um, a lot of this information to kind of go, and we will use it to go and look at the efficacy of how these areas um, are being used. Um, there are a lot of proposals for um, energy development. They're entertaining to now for wind energies offshore. They obviously have potential impacts to not only fisheries, but for, for things like seabirds who are attracted to lights. So a lot of these type of interactions are need to be con they need to be considered as you go forward, but you need to have information there that allows the managers to look at what you have and make decisions um, based on good information. Bycatch mitigation and fishes interactions. We need to understand hot spots. People often don't realize that when you look at an ocean, you see blue water, but to an oceanographer, what you they're not it's not blue. There are many areas of convergent physical properties. There are areas where you have upwelling, you have areas where you have um, convergence, divergence, advection, and it's where, this is where your marine debris aggregates, it's where fish aggregate, it's where fish aggregate is where the birds will come to look for food, it's where the commercial fisheries will target because that's all the target fish that will hit those areas. These are eddies, these are fronts, these are meanders, and they're they're all over like all of the oceans, whether they're inshore or offshore. Um, these hot spots drive how these how all the resources feed and how they interact with um, with their communities. It's something we need to understand a lot better. Marine debris. I've already mentioned that several times. It's something that um, we do need to um, to know more about what it's doing, how it's getting into the food chain, and what it means um, for us as we go down the line. And to just refine the diet specifics from an ecological perspective, um, it's um, we do a lot of we're going to a lot of modeling um, to kind of look at um, what you know what is the uh, you know what is their role uh, with re with regard to the, the ecosystem. Um, models are only good as the information that you feed it, and often we we rely too much on uh, model output without really paying attention to to actually what's feeding the models. Um, so I did want to just put up one slide um, that's not has nothing to do with feeding, but it's a but it is a data set that the Fish and Wildlife had maintained for many years, um, because I do believe some of these op long term observations that I'm not sure if they still maintain them, but they are very critical. In this case, is the reproductive success of some of the birds. Um, this is for the Laysan and albatross. These are for the albatrosses up at French frigate shows, and you can see that. These in particular, they respond to the environment very strongly. Um, often we in the government tend to say, well, we don't have the resources to maintain these observations, but they're critical for us to really understand uh, what's going on. And you know, I really can't say that enough. Um, but these, this along with some of the diet information shows you how much that what you see in the environment does get reflected in, in the life histories and the ecologies of these animals. So we're going to end it there. Um, I think for the most part that's it. I think I'm on time. And uh, I thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. You know, like I said, um, it's been many years just since I've looked at seabird uh, diets. You know, you, just on literature, you know, I, I almost defer to David. He probably knows more about where it is today. Um, I know what it was, and I see the castings. So I can only go by what you, by what I see see out there. No, nothing analytical, but just the uh, what composes a casting now. Um, and like I say, it's anecdotal. You can see how much plastic that you see in the albatrosses. Um, we have, we put cams out every year. Uh, right now, we have our ship going up there. We're putting, we're returning the monk seals to the, last year we brought in some monk seals for rehabilitation. We're returning them now. Um, and as they go up there, we, we put the monk seal cams onto all of these islands. And they, and they collect, they, 
between the beaches and they and it's amazing of the whether they're lighters whether they're bottles whether they're plastic debris of how many tubs and tubs that they save that they to just accumulate to remove off of the islands that wasn't there 30 years ago are they in the birds um, everything i've read says yes they are they're increasing you see this in the fish as well you know species like um uh, mahi mahi who feed right at the surface tend to have higher plastic than some of the others but still some you know some of the deeper fish are you're finding plastic in their systems um not sure how they get some of them but but yeah I, they are going in there i don't to answer your question though i don't know how much it's i don't there are a lot of people who do look at plastics in the ocean now when they feed on the plastic, do they digest it and pass it on through or just pass it on through? Again, I, I don't know. Um, you know, I could, I can guess some maybe and some not, you know. Um, like I said, the albatross hold, hold a lot of that in. Uh, most of the other birds, you know, they digest and, and pass. But I don't know, it's not something I ever looked at. Chicklet. Okay. You mentioned the aqua boats that were really prevalent. Are there any more operating right now? One, I think. Online? One, yeah. I think there's one. One. So in, in the around 1990, um, the the fishery came up. There was a development of a of the long line fishery using monofilament gear, and um, and it changed very rapidly within. Within the advent of that technology, Hawaii became almost instantaneously one of the top swordfish producing ports in the world. One of the top 10, I think it was number six at the time. At the same time, the cannery closed. Um, they, uh, um, they, they, there was just no place for the Oscar boats to, to land their catch. Um, they tried to freeze them to put them somewhere. There still was a fresh market, uh, market, but they, it just it just wasn't sustainable. The boats were old. These sandpans were ancient then, and they just were, were not sustainable. Very labor intensive. They would go out at early, early in the morning, two, three in the morning to collect the bait. Then they would go out and go out and fish all day, and maybe get in at ten at night. Very difficult life for those folks, you know. And with um, when they with the long line boats came on, and the amount of money they could make catching Big Eye and Yellowfin and the others uh, versus Skipjack, it was a, a much yeah, the writing was on the wall. Could you talk about how the Hawaiian Islands are now being used as tourist destinations? Very easily. They're, they're, they're incredibly tame. Um, you know, we have nets, you know, we have, we have nets. So, you know, obviously you walk up the, some of the turns and now they'll, they'll take off so you'll have a net. Uh, Shear waters are burrows, as are the boated petrels. So you just stick your arm in there and make sure you have gloves because pod for pod, they're really mean. Um, but the albatross, they're, they're, they're incredibly tame, which is why they're so easily abused if, if you let them. But you could walk up to them and just pick them up. Um, we have big nets, so you don't hurt the bird. Um, so it was never our intent to to hurt any of the birds to get the sap. Because I think that was the good thing, because many of my uh, colleagues from, who work in the temperate North Pacific shoot the birds to get their dot, to get their samples. Um, we never had to do that. There are biases by taking regurgitations. There are you are getting some bias in your sample. Um, but I think it's, it, it served the purpose that we needed. But yeah, you just get them. So a lot of them, you just, the boobies especially, or brown boobies would look at you, they'd be so afraid that they'll dump it in front of you without you even touching them. <laughs> but they're my favorite. Some of the others, you have to squeeze a little bit, they'll come out. The petrols, you'd have to squeeze a lot. What the Small squid. Um, and um, and they were the ones that they would get hatchet fishes or they get big tofits. But we never, we never got a whole animal out of a petrol. I think you're competing with that study now with 
be great now that the rats are gone. Some estimates said there's a million of them on the grid. And so how did they go from almost decimated on the colonies mm. to like a million birds in 20 years? Yeah. So like what they're eating would be different. Yeah, and I think Fish and Wildlife has um, folks there. I think that's the only worth, only place they have people now, right? And, and yeah. So it may be worth pursuing. I, and I've talked to Beth Flint it's about trying to do that. Sure. <laughs> but they are protected. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned the albatross scavenge. What was, do you remember the most unusual? Not, not plastic, but natural food item. So, yeah, so you, if you look at them, you see crustaceans in there. And they're not your, your normal crustaceans. So what albatross feed on are very deep water crustaceans. So if, um, they're hyperion arthropods. They're, they're isopods. So we see big isopods. And they're uh, some mice. So they're deep mesobathypelagic mice. It's called Naphrophosia gigas. And, um, and they're bright, bright red because, you know, red becomes black at depth. And so they would, uh, uh, the crustaceans they would feed were, uh, were, were never surfaced. So they were, because they're at depth, I could never understand how they, they would get them. I would often think that because they would be at the surface, something dead would come up and they would tear and pick at them and they would end up getting those as um, food of something that, that they were Thinking. It's the same with could be. It seemed like the some of the squid they they feed on because they're all on beaks. They're you know, they have we have Archituthis beaks in there. You know we have some of the larger squids that they're obviously not going to pick it up on their own. So our sense is that because they're they're scavengers and when they have something, they all kind of a whole bunch of birds will come and just rip it apart. That's how we think they um, they get a lot of what they. Eat. I was going to tell you a student was sorting out from an albatross and found a sheer wire foot. A sheer wire foot. Huh. So frigate birds, I used to get sooty chicks. So it's common to have sooty turned chicks in a frigate bird. And turtles. Yeah. Yeah. I have some questions. They're not scientific, but just things that I wonder at books. That's fine. The, the lighters in the uh, bodies on the midway, I was always amazed at how many lighters are in the ocean. You know, it's not that that's planned or anything. <laughs> but has that, has that been reduced at all? I'm sorry, the. The lighters, in, the lighters that are found in the, the bodies. The light, oh, the, the lighter, lighters, cigarette lighters. Yeah. <clears throat> Have they decreased? Or increased. I mean, I, it's just, I, it just bothered me that there were lighters in the ocean like that. So. Uh, it doesn't surprise me at all. You know, the Asians, you know, if you ever go to Japan, you know, they, they give out lighters that they give out matches here, you know, and and they're, you know, you go out to sea with them, they all smoke and they all have lighters and it, no, it's, but one thing to always remember, um, a lot of these things you hear about marine debris, you hear about nets that come in, they've been circulating in the Pacific for a long time. These things are not things that were lost um, recently. They're, they've been going around and around for decades. Glass balls have not been used in Japan's fisheries for a long time, yet they're still washing up. And so um, lighters, nets, a lot of these things are just they're not a recent thing. They're there are items out there. So I, I believe it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. Sorry. Yeah. 